Good afternoon, we're here at the Teach Educator Conference 2014 in Hyderabad and I'm very pleased um, that we have here with us Julian Edge from the University of Manchester yeah. and um, Steve Mann from the University of Warwick. Thank you for, for joining us both, Not taking time out of your, I imagine, very busy schedule to, um, to come and speak to us. Thanks. Thank you. Um, First question really is about the theme of, of the conference, uh, innovation in English language, teacher education. Mm. Um, and really it's a question for both of you, what's, mm. what's your in interpretation of that theme? Okay, well um, I think the, the theme for us, obviously having published this book, um, we wanted to, to, to have a presentation, a plenary, which addressed the concept of innovation, where does it come from? Who does it belong to? Who directs it? Where, where does it? How does it happen? So it was important to us to put the emphasis on innovation as a process, uh, something that needs to be to be gone through for teachers to to work out for themselves, not to be imposed from the top down. Um, those ideas may come from the top down, but they they need to involve teachers. Teachers need to have a chance to to trial things, to give their input. It's a two-way process. Mm -hmm. So I think innovation for us, and one of the reasons why we were pleased to, to be asked to talk about it, puts the emphasis on this ongoing sense of working something out. It's not something that's delivered ready-made. It needs an engagement in the process. So mm -hmm. it's, it's that ongoing sense of encoded in the word innovation that we like and we respond to. Yeah, I think all, all I'd add to that, and they're both implicit in what Steve said, is that um, one, an innovation is an innovation in a particular context. Yeah. It might not be totally new, indeed a few things are. Mm. So what's, what's new to one context might not be new to another, but still an innovation in that context. Mm. And, and secondly, to be an innovation, we would say, it has to be something that, that is implemented. A new idea is not an innovation. Mm -hmm. When something's realised in practice, new in context, that's an innovation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Interesting that you've mentioned top down as being in, kind of in, in, integral to that, whereas it seems to have been in, in, in some talks perhaps sort of derided as, 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 as the wrong approach, but obviously you're talking about in, integrating, integrating that in, in, into the process. So it is there's value there of, 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 of some form of, of top-down um, training that, that, that's happening. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult balance. I'm certainly not making an argument for a top-down um, process. I'm just recognising that um, there will be top-down initiatives. Ministries, yeah. um, publishers, training agencies will want to um, try and foster encourage, facilitate, mm -hmm. reflection, innovation, but that they, that's a reality, it's not going to go away, but, but if they're doing that then they ought to at least try all these things or find out what teachers want to innovate with. They need, they need to know something about the context, they need to know something about the constraints, some of the things that, that will need to be overcome by teachers. So. We're, we're not ma making an argument at all for a top top down. We, in an ideal world, innovation would always come from would be practitioner led. Yeah. But I think we're realistic enough to realise that 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 always that won't always happen, and that sometimes um, a top down directive or um, an initiative may may be useful, but it needs to still to be yeah. um, shaped to context. Yeah, I think top-down also has an ambiguity to it. it. It sounds as though it means some sort of diktat or some sort of directive, mm. um, which is, is seldom uh, successful because in the end it will be ignored in practice, yeah. perhaps. Um, but there's also a, a top-down sense in the sense of those people who are in power in a certain situation making it known that they are responsive to the idea of, of, of innovation. They're keen on people staying on their toes and expressing how they want to develop. Yeah. They're keen for innovation to take place without wanting to control what that innovation is. Mm -hmm. okay. 
and that's also top down. And I think when you, you get a mix of that uh, in that second sense, top down, the, the the readiness from those above to support innovation, and the desire from those the. the Mm. You know the whole top and bottom thing mm, is, yeah, is, is yeah, so it's unpleasant, I'm actually uncomfortable using those yeah, no, things. Um, yeah. um, if you could turn it on its side, yeah. as uh, our colleague David Charles used to write about, mm, mm. if those mm. people act at the front of the action yeah. are keen to, their con keen to innovate in their context, and those people behind that action, but who have lots of control over it, are keen to support that innovation, so front of house and back of house, if you're getting pressure from both, mm -hmm. that's when you're likely to get an innovation that is implemented and taken up and sticks, I think. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and I'd just add to that, in Vanessa Lee's talked in this conference a couple of times about creating a learning culture, a reflective culture within an organisation. So that in itself might be a top-down, although we don't like the term, it might be a top-down initiative, but it's only if you create the culture where where practitioners feel able to innovate yeah that that, that will happen okay. okay thank you you've recently launched um this publication as part of the british council's innovation series uh, innovations in pre-service education and training for english language teachers uh, i mean the, the, the title kind of says it really but could you sort of <laughs> yes, it's, it's long enough to say quite a lot <laughs> yes but in terms of in terms of the themes within within that can you can you kind of expand on i'm not asking you to, to tell me every, mm. every page but obviously mm. some of some of the themes that, that occur mm. within within the publication yeah um there are several chapters on technological innovation okay. um there, there are then chapters particularly on how reflection is is supported is, is, is made possible there are there's a chapters from a materials perspective chapter from a curriculum perspective chapters from methodology perspective and those on separate categories they all they all overlap in a sense and that variety in one sense uh, became almost a problem to us as we we were faced with this business of, of choosing chapters. We had about 150 responses, I think, didn't we, to this mm. call, mm. and um, 12 to 14 chapters to, to wow. choose. It was tremendously difficult. Yeah. So, so um, there is this overlapping variety of, uh, of topics and approaches, and we first of all set out trying to, to group them conceptually or, or, or topically and failed and so in the end we we decided for a, a sequencing which which followed the sun around the planet it started off where we were in Britain and we slowly moved west okay. through Africa across the Atlantic into the Americas round through East Asia through Asia back to the Mediterranean back to Britain and that's how the whole thing is sequenced okay. Steve yeah um one of the things I think we wanted to do in the book was to give space for different kinds of processing uh, processes within pre-service teacher education. So um, there's a range of things beyond, say, teaching practice and lectures, where, for example, you might encourage a teacher to go and shadow somebody in a school in an ethnographic kind of way to follow them around and see you know, what the holistic picture of being a teacher is like, or, or maybe going to a conference, or developing um, an online platform through something like Pebblepad so that uh, practitioners, teachers begin to reflect and that you can engage with their reflections. We ask, we ask teachers to go and observe classes, but often they don't really know what they're supposed to observe what, and how are they supposed to write notes. So one of the contributions looks at a more ethnographic way of observing, writing notes and then has suggestions about how that concrete data might then be fed back into the teacher, edu pro teacher education process. So I think it was important to choose a range, not only of different countries, but a range of processes which are innovative but 
again going back to the idea that innovation is a process, we wanted to know what exactly they did, what, what procedures they followed with some examples and how they and the, the teachers, how they evaluated that process, what did they think of it. And the rationale behind that was that somebody reading that book can pick it up, read one of the chapters and say, yeah, I could do that in my course and I understand how I could do that because there's a kind of a procedural template for it. Mm. Um, and that will be, you know, locally negotiated and it will be, it will be tweaked and changed. But at least in this book, there are some procedures and some, you know, how to do something. So, you know, right from things like corpus analysis, analysis getting people to investigate their own writing. So they're doing two things at once. They're finding out something about their writing, but they're also learning something about corpus analysis. So that was very much part of it. Get a range of different processes so that a, a teacher might think, yeah, I'd like to do a bit more of that and that would be interesting. What would happen if I try that with my teachers? If I could just come back on, on one more point sure. there. Um, another theme that we were keen on is this idea of, of teacher educators practicing what they preach mm. uh, and not banging on constantly about the importance of continuing professional development for teachers mm -hmm. while not being seen to be involved in it themselves and so we asked each author to have an element in their chapter of and what did I learn from this yeah. and you know, how has this affected me as a teacher educator and we hope that comes through as well okay. yeah and if I can and we, we do this <laughs> we kind of bounce off each other sometimes um, that's very much what we wanted to do with, with each of these um, contributions is, is that we had quite a lot of contributions that looked like someone had done a PhD and then turned it into a paper, but they didn't have that sense of practitioner research that somebody was investigating their own practice and that's really tied in with this practicing what you preach idea that these are people who are training who are also looking at their own practice and writing about it. Great, thank you. Julian, you, you, in, in the talk you talked about a scenario where mm. if we started out devising a language learning theory now, we wouldn't begin with a, with a monolingual approach. Could you expand on that a little bit perhaps for the people who, who, weren't, who aren't here um, and perhaps didn't see the, 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 the talk online? Yes, I, I think um, if you search the libraries of the world, someone once pointed out, you will not find a book on monolingualism because that is so built in to the literature. So you have books on bilingualism, multilingualism, but nobody writes about monolingualism. Mm. Nobody writes about the impoverishment of the monolingual mind. No one writes about the language learning problems of the monolingual because everything's written from that perspective. And, and particularly if, if you passed through ever so briefly a country and a culture such as India, you realise that if you were going to devise language learning theory and language teaching approaches, starting here and now, it's very unlikely that you would decide to do so from, the, from a monolingual perspective. Mm -hmm. Which it seems to me, I mean this is not a, a, an original point clearly, but I think it's a point that, that bears repeating. that. There are there's sort of 50 years at least of, of research to be caught up on, mm -hmm. starting from here. Starting from, I, I speak as fundamentally monolingual. I've, you know, I've learned a number of languages, I speak them to a certain extent. But always there's that nagging thought that, I know this is a chair. It might be called something else in German and something else in Arabic, and some, but you know, I know it's a chair. Mm -hmm. But imagine the child who grows up from the very instant of communication, knowing that the world is not named once and then translated. The world is named multiply. The world is named in, sh named in shifting, overlapping ways, all of which are a part of communication, all of which are, are a part of language acquisition. And if you start from that sort of awareness, it seems to me that the well, I repeat myself, <laughs> you wouldn't start from a monolingual perspective. And, and I, I've, I've seen 
in, in conference presentations here, people who are starting from uh, from that perspective. And there is, of course, a, a literature I, I referred to one or two sources. And um, if I can go on a little bit longer, I, I, it seems to me highly likely, and it seems to me as, as, a, as a foreigner very much to be wished that, uh, that that body of research and this nascent practice of language teaching in a multilingual reality will come together. Um, and I only hope that it does not come together in that same old tired, well, this is the theory, now you teachers have to apply it way, which has been getting in our way, you know, for as long as I've been involved in yeah. language teaching, which is much too long. Um, but that, again, as well as the newness of the theory, a newly creative way of of understanding arising from practice and practice being theorized and the two working together could possibly emerge. That would be a thing of wonder. Okay. Thank you. Um, Steve, uh, in your in your section of, of the talk you, mm -hmm. you, you talked about the um, the co-build series and also you talked about Russell Stannard's work. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between between those two? Mm. Okay, um, the topic of the talk is about innovation and where that innovation comes from. And as I've said, one of the important things for us is that innovation at least needs to include practitioners and their views, how they feel about using materials, what do they need. And it seems to me there's, there's, there's potentially been a shift, although I wouldn't want to overemphasize uh, this, away from the idea that we can deliver a course book which is going to answer everybody's needs in everybody's contexts. And I use the co-build project because you know we know Jane and Dave Willis. Um, Dave unfortunately isn't with us anymore um, but we were colleagues with them and so, so I knew that project, I knew how much work went into the co-build project. Um, and, you know, as Scott Thornbury, I used a quote from Scott Thornbury to say that, you know, it was a very principled and interesting idea that came from SLA, a lot of research in test-based learning. And it was translated through a lot of corpus analysis into a course book, which was, was going to, to answer people's problems in classrooms. The problem was that practitioners couldn't use it because they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready to move away from a sort of PPP model to lots of busy tasks on a page, lots of authentic uh, recorded tasks with native speakers, not scripted, talking, talking, you know, with, with overlap and all kinds of, you know, different language, not, it wasn't simplified, which on, on many levels we would applaud and say, you know, what a good idea, that's a great innovation, but because it wasn't trialled properly with teachers over a period of time it rushed it was rushed to market probably as a lot of you know publishers ventures are it, it didn't do very well it doesn't may, mean it wasn't a good idea it doesn't mean that was wasn't good research behind it but but if it's not properly orientated to context then you know failure is potentially inbuilt into into the whole idea um, the, the link that I tried to make by showing the work of Russell Stannard is he starts with where teachers are and he's not delivering a whole course book, he's showing how to use a particular tool like Lyric Trainer or Vokaroo or Jing, but his eye is on you know, what teachers might do with these particular tools. So when he uses screen capture software and talks through his TTV website, he's thinking what do, what, what do teachers need to know about that? What might be useful for them? And so it's a much more dialogic process. It's a lot more grounded in what teachers think. Um, so, you know, there, there has been a shift away from the course book to, say, online delivery. Um, but it may be that publishers are still trying to dream up and put together an all-encompassing online platform book, which will do the same. But unless it's properly oriented to practitioners unless they're involved and their contexts are taken into account, I think these large-scale ventures 
are, less, are, are not very likely to succeed, might be misguided, um, and that we need to, in the pre-service teacher education uh, system, enable teachers to, to understand what the resources are out there, and there are a lot more resources available on the internet, and how they might go to these sources and think about their teaching and draw on these tools and ideas. So, I'm not quite sure what the link was, but it was something something like that. Okay, very good. Um, thinking about, obviously we're, we're, we're the last day of, of this year's conference, um, thinking possibly ahead to, to next year, are there any particular themes that you would like to see addressed at uh, the, the Teacher Educator Conference 2015? Um, I, th I think for us to answer that question would fly in the face of um, all the things that we've been trying to say mm -hmm. about uh, the need to be responsive to requests and requirements and aspiration because it shouldn't be problem oriented either and the aspirations that are um, that come up from from the, the teaching cadre in, in the same way that uh, a needs analysis, a wants analysis, an aspirations analysis needs to be carried out before any kind of teaching operation takes place. I think that would be where the themes for future conferences would come rather than from, from visitors. Okay. Okay. Great. Julian, Steve, thank you very much for taking the time out to come and speak to us. It's been thank a you. pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.